slavery. Chapter 3 from edition 7 is the slave trade in the new world, and chapter 2 from edition 9 is called Africans in the Atlantic World. And what I've done is I tried to explain to you in the email is I'm going to combine the two texts, two chapters, because what they've done with edition and 9 is basically they've just combined the old chapter 1 and 2 into chapter 1, so it's very confusing, but I'll try to get it straightened out for you. So what I'm going to do is you cannot follow me in either one of the texts. I've taken information from both the chapters and some I've done on my own research and we're going to depend totally on the lecture and the PowerPoint. That being said, slavery is an ancient institution and it long predates Christianity and even many early Christians were slaves in the Roman Empire. And without exception, the pre-Christian world accepted slavery as normal and desirable. The Greek philosopher Aristotle even claimed that from the hour that you're born, that some are marked for subjugation and some others are marked for rule. And the great civilizations of Mesopotamia, and Babylon, and Egypt, Greece, Rome, and all the civilizations in Central America and Africa were built on slave labor. People became slaves simply by being a debtor or they'd be sold into slavery by their parents or born to slave parents, or maybe they were captives of war, or maybe they'd even been kidnapped by the slave traders or pirates. But slave dealing was an accepted way of life, fully established in all societies. In fact, the very word slave comes from the peoples of Eastern Europe, the Slavs. The word means slave, and that's a branch of Russia. Even St. Patrick, the English missionary to the Irish, was once a slave himself. He'd been kidnapped from his home and taken to Ireland very much against his will. Now, Patrick spoke out very strongly against slavery, and he also wrote, quote, But it is the woman kept in slavery who suffers the most, unquote. The Greeks, from where we derive so many modern humanistic ideas, were utterly dependent upon slavery. Even Plato's Republic was firmly based on slave labor. Plato said that if you had 50 or more slaves, that represented the possessions of a very wealthy man. And under Roman law, oh man, when a slave owner was found murdered, all of his slaves were to be executed. And in one case, we have a record of a man who was murdered and he had 400 of his slaves who were put to death. Now, before the coming of Christ, most nations despised manual labor. It was something only slaves did. And three quarters of the population of Athens, of course, were slaves. Slavery was indigenous to the African and the Arabian countries before it made its way to Europe. Slavery was practiced by the tribes of the American Indians long before Columbus set foot on the shores of the New World. Ethiopia had slavery until 1942, Saudi Arabia until 1960, Peru until 1968, and India didn't outlaw slavery until 1976. Now what is seldom remembered, and not widely known, is that many black Americans in the 19th century actually owned slaves. And I think you'll find that up in your book you're reading. According to the United States Census of 1830 and the little town of Charleston, South Carolina, 407 black Americans owned slaves. Now much has been written about what we call the transatlantic slave trade, yet you see very little attention given to the Islamic slave trade across the Sierra and the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. And while the European involvement in the transatlantic slave trade to the Americans lasted just over three centuries, the Muslim involvement in the slave trade lasted some 14 centuries. And in some parts of the Muslim world, it's still continuing even today. So when you compare the Islamic slave trade to the American slave trade, it, there's some very interesting contrast. Two of every three slaves that were shipped across the Atlantic were men. But in the Islamic world, that was reversed two women for every man were enslaved by the Muslims. And the mortality rate for slaves being transported across the Atlantic was just as high as about 10%. The percentage of slaves dying in the transit and trans-Sahara and East African slave trade, according to most sources, was between 80 and 90%. And while almost all the slaves shipped across the Atlantic were for agricultural work, most of the slaves destined for the middle Muslim Middle East were for sexual exploitation as concubines and harems or for military service. Now there were many children born to slaves in the Americas and millions of their descendants are now citizens both in the US and in Brazil. But if you look at the Middle East, very, very few descendants of the slaves actually 
survive. Most of the slaves that went to the Americas would marry, either legally or in their own cultural fashion, and have families. But the male slaves destined for the Middle East were usually castrated. And most of the children, especially if they were females, born to women who were slaves, were killed at birth. Young boys, as young as nine, would be castrated for several reasons. They, they would bring a higher price on the market, of course, because the rich wanted eunuchs for their harems and for military positions. And there'd be stations along the slave route where the surgery would be performed. And believe you me, the surgeries were not performed in the most sanitary conditions. Thousands of young boys bled to death as a result of this attempted castration. Now, there is also a great debate over the numbers of Africans that were transported to the New World, but the estimates that we have that are pretty reliable right now are between 10 to 12 million. And most of them, between oh, 80 and 90 percent, went to South America or the Caribbean islands, mostly in the Spanish or the Portuguese or French possessions. Actually, only less than 5 percent actually came to North America. Now, it's been estimated that something like 25 million were involved in the Muslim trade. And as I told you a bit earlier, about 80 to 90 percent of them died en route. So when you combine that number with the number sold in the slave markets and the number that died, you have a staggering amount of roughly 100 million people. Now, Christian reformers spearheaded a uh, anti-slavery movement in Europe, and Great Britain even used her maybe to intercept slave trades for a while. But there was no opposition to slavery within the Muslim world. But getting back to the Muslim trade, some say that there is a conspiracy of silence in the Muslim slave trade. And when you look at the Arabian world, there is not a large black population, not like in the Americas. But it goes back to the practice of creating eunuchs and murdering female babies. And with the non-existence of a black population and literature, if slavery is discussed at all, it's claimed to be an exclusive Western phenomenon. So the Muslims are portraying themselves to their own people as liberators and not enslavers. But the records from Morocco in the year 1876, for instance, show that slave prices varied from 10 pounds, or $48, to 30 pounds, or $140. And it was a female slave that comprised the vast majority of sales, of course, with attractive virgins, fetching between $192 and $386 of our dollars. And of course, those were destined to cross the Sahara to become a member of a concubine. But let's go back just a little further. And, uh, Historian David, Robert Davis, did a lot of research in his book called Christian Slaves, Muslim Masters, White Slavery in the Mediterranean, the Barbary Coast of Italy, which is a very long title, and sometimes we historians don't know when to shut up. Now, according to his research, he estimates that as many as one million Europeans were abducted and enslaved between 1530 and 1780. Now, these were white Christians. They were seized in a series of raids which depopulated coastal towns from Sicily to Cornwall. Thousands of white Christians in coastal south areas were seized year in and year out to work as galley slaves on the ships, to work as laborers and concubines for the Muslim slave traders in today what is known as Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and Liberia. Liberia, Liberia. Uh, you know, the, the countries right there on the north coast of Africa on the Mediterranean. Villages and towns on the coast of Italy and Spain and Portugal and France were the hardest hit, but the Muslim slave traders also went as far afield as Britain and Ireland and, and Iceland. They even captured 130 American seamen from ships that boarded in the Atlantic between 1783 and 1793. And if you were in American history class, we would discuss the Barbary Coast Wars between the U.S. and the pirates. But you never heard of those, have you? The problem for the U.S. at that time is we were no longer under the protection of the British Navy because of the American Revolution and the U.S. had no Navy to speak of. It was these little skirmishes that the American Navy had, uh, that the American Navy really developed, along with the Marines. And the words of the Marine hymn, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Yep, that's the Tripoli on the northern coast of Africa. And by the way, one of our greatest complaints of Thomas Jefferson, who was our new president, George Washington, chose to pay tribute to the pirates for safe passage, going through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean instead of going to war. But Jefferson, when he became president, and then Madison chose a different course when they became president. But that's American history. Let's just back to my story. According to one report, Mr. Davis found more than 7,000 English people were abducted between 1622 and 1644. Many of them uh, ships and crews, the entire ship. But the Corsairs always landed on an unguarded beach and often at night to snatch away, shall we say, the unwary. 
Almost all of the inhabitants of the village of Baltimore in Ireland were captured in 1631, and there were other raids as well. And these captives were white and Christian. And they put the working quarries, they had to build sites and gallery, uh, galleys. They even endured malnutrition and disease and general mistreatment at the hands of their slave masters, of course. So when you consider that less than 5% of all transatlantic slaves end up in North America, and the vast amount of films, books, and articles concerning the slave trade, they concentrate only on the American involvement. It's as though that slavery was a unique American aberration. Of course, my opinion uh, is the reason this is twofold. One, we're going to eventually fight a war in a large part over slavery, and slavery of any kind, especially one based on the color of one's skin, is believed to be immoral by Americans. The one thing I do want to remind you of is the myth. The myth of the European slave traders venturing into deep jungles of Africa to capture free people. It's a myth. They did not have to use force to obtain the slaves. The slaves were sold to them by their own black brothers. There was no need for the raider to risk their lives. They simply purchased the captives from the African chiefs and even Muslim traders in the African coast. The truth? Slaves were sold to the captors by other Africans. Now, the Renaissance. The Renaissance is a French word that simply means rebirth. And it begins in Italy in about 1450. And in many ways, it's what it was. But your text casually mentions the word and links it along with something called the Commercial Revolution. And our text author agrees, uh, tries to uh, credit the Renaissance with creating the Commercial Revolution, which in turn led to the creation of the institution of the slave trade. Now, usually I agree with our authors. But I have a bit of trouble with this idea. Now, let's spend just a few minutes explaining the Renaissance, and I'll get back to that statement. Historians always love to identify time periods and divide them into sections and give them names. It helps us to identify decades or even centuries. And the time frame we call the Renaissance is roughly the time frame between the 14th and the 16th century. It takes place right after the time frame we named the Dark Ages which was a time of raiding by tribes or clans from the areas of Russia and China. There was one plague after the other in bad growing seasons in Europe. So this Renaissance, it began in the ununified country of Italy, around 1450 or so. And for some reason, we have never been able to figure out why, there began to be an ancient an interest in the ancients, like Rome and Greece. And it was decided that their architecture and literature and art were really worth duplicating. So then they began to be interested in studying the world around them. And then there was contact with the Muslim traders and new ideas from as far away as China and India that began to creep into the society. So it wasn't just the study of the ancients, but the study of the past began to merge with new ideas and a new society which was beginning to be formed. Then there was something called the printing press invented by a little German named Gutenberg. The Crusaders began returning from the Holy Lands with information, and wealthy families began to sponsor talented people to paint and to sculpture and to write. And there was a development of a new financial technique and many scientific discoveries. And for instance, there were those made by Galileo and Coper Copernicus and Copernicus. I have trouble with his name. Copernicus and Isaac Newton. All these men uh, were very learned, and they discovered things through observation. And of course, they were all denounced by the Church because they disagreed with the doctrine of the church. But the church couldn't close that door to scientific observation once it had been opened, because it's like any slippery slope. Once you open the door, you can't close it. But the scholars who studied the past works of the Greeks and the Romans discovered a spirit similar to theirs, one that valued innovation in the world rather than looking forward to the world after death, which was just what the church was really preaching at the times. Things will be better for you after you die, if you lead a good life on this earth. The church speaks for God. Even if you wanted to know more about God or talk to him yourself, this was not allowed. Everything had to be through the church. The church knows best. And this type of people who were doing the inquiring and observing were called humanists. And they began to teach and emphasize the importance of human values instead of religious beliefs or doctrines. And the irony was these men were all devout Christians. They had no doubt of God. But their ideas and positions put them in direct odds with the church. Now this put them in, in a time frame that's going to coincide with the Renaissance and the thing we call nation building. 
where countries big and small are going to come together. But before this time, the countries weren't the countries as we know them today. Uh, yes, there were kings of Germany and France and England, but the kings actually had very little power or territory. They were just basically large clans. And the nation of Italy was nothing more than a series of large, powerful city-states. But as the Renaissance began to spread out of Italy, and the Black Death seems to have taken a long vacation, the local kin kings began to consolidate their areas, and we begin to see local wars as the kings are trying to increase their holdings. As a matter of fact, one of the first countries to become stable and have a stable government and have definite borders was Portugal. And that's why she had to jump on so many other countries, which we'll get into very in a few minutes. So you've got the Renaissance and nation building going on at the same time. Now this is from the text, direct quote. The freedom to pursue these ends that would be most beneficial to the soul and the body. Unquote. A new kind of freedom. And I guess you could say the thinkers of today really fit into that category. But another statement. It developed into such a passionate search that it resulted in the destruction of the long established practices and beliefs and even to the destruction of the rights of others to pursue the same ends for their own benefit. Now I personally agree with the first part of that, but not the last. These men, like I mentioned, Perticus, Galileo, Newton, uh, they were punished for their thoughts. And it was not the ordinary man like you and me. It was relatively few that even had the time and the money to pursue these ends to think. Most citizens of all the countries were just busy trying to stay alive and see another morning. Now, I don't know how our text author makes the leap from a new kind of freedom to freedom to enslave. Freedom to think was going around a bit, but freedom was not a concept held by most anybody at this time in history. I believe our authors had confused a commercial revolution with nation building. Because along with nation building, there's a certain segment of society that's going to profit, sure. Just as in any war today, there's certain businesses that's going to make money. Now those businesses are going to flourish, furnish the needs of the government for the war. And they're going to make money. And that was going on during the nation building phase. But I cannot see in any way how satisfying the needs of the government, and in the beginning that's what it was, the Portuguese and the Spanish slave traders originally were working for or under the auspice of their government and for the glory of their government. The people who helped furnish the financing for their trips, of course, made money. Now, where do you see a new concept of freedom in that? I get the feeling that our authors are trying to say that it was looking for a way to make profit from the slave trade that the exploration and colonies were set up. And he, in my opinion, is confusing an economic policy called mercantilism with commercialism. And to get that, we have to discuss balance of trade and the country's gross national product, and we're not going there. But nowhere do I see the real reason for slavery in the New World in this particular section. The reason for it was plain, pure, and simple labor, or I should say lack of labor. Lack of labor combined with a distinctly racist feeling toward anyone that did not meet your own particular standards and the lack of a desire to do manual work guaranteed that the African was in for a rough time. So with all that background now, we can date almost to the month when the slave trade began in Europe. It was the year 1441, Common Era, when a little Portuguese ship commanded incidentally by uh, a man named Con, Con Calvez captured 12 black Africans on a raid. And the prisoners he carried back to Lisbon as gifts to Prince Henry the Navigator. Well, Prince Henry was, thought this was great. His new slaves were just tickling this. So he sent word to the Pope seeking approval for more raids. The Pope's reply granted, and I'm going to quote, quote, to all those who shall be engaged in the said war, complete forgiveness for all their sins, unquote. Huh. Well, he was giving them a, a forgiveness in advance. The war he was talking about was the war against the unbelievers in Christ. Thus, in 1455, the papal bull authorized Portugal to reduce to servitude all heathens, or unbelievers in Christianity, all heathen peoples. But who are these Portuguese and who began a practice to condemn millions of people to slaver, slavery, especially in the New World? Well, number one, they were very skillful, fearless sailors who would go far out into the sea. And you can't imagine when you think this world is flat, if you stay on it too far, you're going to go off the end of it. I mean, these people had to be really brave to go out of sight of land after sardines and tuna and whale. And their prince, Henry, was a very ambitious and far-sighted nobleman 
who decided he was going to advance Portugal's dominion southward because he couldn't go to the east. There was Spain. He couldn't go to the west. There was the Atlantic Ocean. He couldn't go to the north. I mean, <laughs> there's other countries there, and then you've got the Mediterranean. He, he had to go somewhere. So Prince Henry wanted better knowledge of the Western Ocean and, and the unknown coast of Africa. He assembled a very valuable library of maps and charts and raised funds to build new ships and hire crews. And he was also using some of the church funds, incidentally. He got the very best Arabian and Jewish astronomers and mathematicians and map makers and persuaded them to join. So together they gathered reports on the winds and the tides and the movement of birds and fishes. And they worked out tables and were able to calculate longitudes and latitudes. And though the Arabians, had, uh, they learned of Chinese inventions in navigation and shipbuilding and made it possible to design ships capable of withstanding the really rough ocean weather and sailing against the wind. Now what we would call today a brain trust was gotten together by Henry. And I use that word loosely, but uh, whenever he could, of course, he would offer prizes of wealth to anyone to encourage them to have a new invention or a better navigational device. So his court kind of became the center of geographical study and practical exploration. But his sailors were the best trained and his ships the best sailing vessels of their times. And equipped with these ships and sails they could master the wind, year by year the Portuguese pushed further and further south down the uh, African coast. And by the end of the 15th century, Vasco da Gama was able to lead three ships around the Cape of Good Hope, the very southern tip of Africa, and up the northeastern coast of Africa and across the ocean to India. Of course, Prince Henry had been dead for almost 40 years at the time they opened the way from Europe to Asia and the mouth of the Amazon in South America. But he had his vision, and it worked and he will be given credit for it. So how did they finance these expeditions? Well, they brought back slaves to work on their sugar plantations. So home markets, oh, they're hungry for sugar. So Prince Henry had sugar cane plants brought from Cyprus and Sicily, and he planted them in Madeira in about 1420. He financed his first water mill by for crushing the cane in 1452. So by the 1460s, he had a very highly profitable sugar plantations had been established in most of the islands. So by the time Columbus actually got to America, they already had a lot of experience in establishing and holding colonies and developing a very profitable business. But a dozen years after the initial voyage when they brought back some slaves, the uh, Southern Sahara chieftains, called the Berber chieftains, began trading horses for slaves with the black rulers and getting 10 to 15 men for one horse. They traded silver and silks and other goods. Now the slaves in turn were then sold by the Arabians to the Portuguese. And in the early course of the trade, the Portuguese brought about a thousand slaves a year into the country. But before the century ended, slaving had moved far down the African coast, crossing the equator to reach Angola, which is 2,300 miles southeast of the Senegal River. And for their tax dollars and horses, the Portuguese were getting, as I said, gold and also leather and ivory and more than 3,000 slaves a year. In less than 100 years, Lisbon slaves numbered 10,000 in a population of 100,000. And there were more than 60 slave markets in that one city. But as impressive as that all sounds, the slave trade did not dominate the trade with Africa. The early adventurers were looking for luxuries, not laborers. They wanted silks and perfumes and drugs and spices and sugar. And it was Asia, not Africa, that produced these items. Africa did offer ivory and rare animal skins and ostrich feathers and ebony and gold and slaves. And as thrilled as Prince Henry been over his new slaves, he wanted the gold. He wanted to reach the gold fields of Guyana by sea and bypass the Muslims who controlled the Trans-Sahara trade routes. And by 1509, Portugal's daring sailors sitting around the Cape of Good Hope were able to trade all along the African coast from Senegal to the Red Sea. And in their travels, the Portuguese discovered a very flourishing slave trade in the hands of the Arabians. Ivory and gold and iron and slaves were the main products, of course, traded by Arabians from the East Africa. And in the 15th century, the slave trade extended all through Eastern Africa. The Arabians shipped the slaves to Arabia, Persia, and India. And from, for your information, what I could find out, that voyage was worse than any of the infamous Atlantic slaving voyages. A group called the Swahili traders worked with the tribes to stop the coast who raided further inland for captives, in other words, black capturing black. 
and coming out to the coast and caravans, the slaves were used as beasts of burden. They were forced to carry ivory and other trade goods. Great hardships, I guess you would call it, for the captives on the march. And of course, it's nothing compared to the hardships and suffering they're going to have when they get on the ships. But the Portuguese began erecting their first forts in West Africa at Elmira on the Gold Coast in 1481. It was a castle basically built with walls 30 feet thick and had 400 cannon to keep off others. Its dungeons could house, house a thousand captive slaves. But the fort didn't stand long because the English, the French, the Swedes, the Dutch, and even the Prussians also began building forts to fight for a piece of Africa's slave trade. But it was a search of gold that was paramountly primary because at the time slavery was used for domestic use, use in Europe and in their Lord, it limited need of it. Portuguese would exchange salt and cloth and tools and trinkets for the gold they sought. And in 1491, the Portuguese actually reached the Bantu people in the Congo and they even baptized their chief as King John I. And the Bantu chieftains then supplied slave labor for the sugar plantations that the Portuguese had established on the Tropic Islands just north and west of the Congo River. A year later, Columbus reaches the New World and institutes a uh, colonization process built upon slave labor. Uh, he basically steals the Portuguese idea of the plantation. Now Columbus is called the Admiral of the Sea, and he's credited with the discovery of the New World, but uh, we know now that he did not discover something that wasn't lost, but he also must, also must be remembered for instituting the American way of slave trade. But when he reached the New World, he had no idea he'd reached a landmass between Europe and Asia. He thought, really thought he found the island of the Indies off the coast of Asia. So that's why he called the people Los Indies or the Indians. And it was a long time before the Europeans realized they'd made a mistake, and by that time the name had been, well, kind of permanently fixed on the peoples who dwelt it here. And of course, that much you already knew. But more serious in the era in the name was the failure of the Europeans to understand just how different the culture of the Indians was from themselves. The Indian society had almost nothing in common with European societies. And the Europeans were blind to the realities of their culture. They even debated at first whether the Indians were not just some subhuman species with two legs. and They were like animals. They lacked souls. And they, they couldn't understand or did they even try. So they labeled them as savage or barbarians. And they also didn't realize that there wasn't just one single Indian culture or people, but there was many different ones that had many different racial characteristics, cultures, and languages. They were just as widely varied as people in Europe. And of course, that first contact proved catastrophic a catastrophe for the Indians. The Spanish conquerors of the Caribbean not only destroyed the culture, but with murder, disease, and slavery, literally destroyed the entire population. Columbus actually captured about 1,500 Indians, and he loaded 500 of them onto a boat, and divided the women on four ships and told these men they could take, take the pick of the rest. And another 600 were chosen, and the remainder was set free. And when the ships actually arrived back in Spain in 1495, only 300 of the original 1,000 were still alive. And they were sold to the slave markets, but of course they didn't last long. Within a very short time, they were all died. He also began the system of forcing the Indians into slave labor. And under his system, the Spanish soldiers and colonists were each granted a tract of land or even a village with all the inhabitants. And then the inhabitants were forced to extract gold from the local riverbeds and give the biggest percentage, of course, to the landlords. And the pressure to conform with the conditions of living caused many to run away, of course, or revolt. But Columbus then punished them with torture or execution, or he sent the hounds after them. And thousands even took poison to kill themselves rather than submit. So death was wholesale. More than one-third of the locals died within the first year, and in 50 years it's estimated that only 500 of the original 300,000 were left. So as the rights of the New World are being contested between Spain and Portugal, enter a new pope, Pope Alexander VI. So he issued a papal bull that divided all unexplored lands in the world, giving Brazil and the New World and Africa to Portugal and the rest of the world undis undis undiscovered uh, to Spain. The Spanish and the Portuguese, within a very few decades, well, the other European countries get jealous and start pouring into the Americas to begin to plunder. And the irony is that at first the Indians welcomed the newcomers. Uh, they helped them even set up their colonies. But it didn't take long for them to find different. 
in the Caribbean, Central and South America, the Spanish forced the men to work in the mines, and the women into domestic and agriculture work. And within a very short time, the plantation system began to develop there, and from their European experiences, and you begin to see sugar and tobacco and cotton plantations. Large-scale productions that required plenty of cheap labor to make any money. So it's no surprise that the Spanish turned to slave labor. After all, no self-respecting Spaniard would soil his hands with manual labor. Where in Africa, agricultural labor was considered the highest of professions. In Spain, it was on the other end of the scale. Now, the workforce began with local Indians, which died quickly, of course, between 14 and 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and combined with the white man's diseases. So they began to use Europeans who were sent into various forms of forced labor, like indentured servants and the, servants and the convicts. And lastly, they began to import slaves. Let me make one quick point. Again, Africans had long known domestic slavery and had traded slaves internally before the Europeans arrived on the continent. Now, we also know that Africans were on the coast of Hispaniola as early as 1501, but it was in 1518 when the first cargo of slaves arrived. And the irony is that they were brought in by a Spanish priest who felt sorry for the Indians. But by 1600, African slaves had landed in the Americas, and during the next century, Europe's demand for sugar shot up, and the Dutch, French, and English began to compete for the slave markets of the Caribbean. By 1700, some historians, and the one I'm using is Milton Be uh, Belt Meltzer, said that some 2,750,000 slaves had crossed the Atlantic, and the Portuguese no longer had a monopoly. And your text does a really good job explaining the division of the trade among the European nations. Like I said, they first started using the indigenous laborers, and they weren't interested in taking care of the people. They were only interested in making money for the hip pocket, or in other words, exploitation of natural resources. And, oh, the inhumane methods they used, you know, like with the whip and things, it just, it was just terrible. And, of course, the natives were very susceptible to the disease of the Europeans. They had no, <laughs> had, they never had measles and mumps and things like that. And this discipline, this having to work, you know, they were used to, you work in good weather, you work up to, sun, up to sundown, and then you quit. But the regime, the discipline, it, it just, and you needed more and more and more for the larger cultural developments. So why did we enslave the Africans? Well, because of his color. Not because he was black, but because, because of his color, he would stand out. If he tried to run away, you could find him easily. Whereas if it was an Indian, he'd melt into the trees. If it was a white man, he could go into a city and melt into the population. But the black man, he was very obvious wherever he was, so he could be easily apprehended, and he could be purchased. He would be your property, and of course they weren't Christian, and they were cheaper than getting those white indentured servants, and the supply was inexhaustible. I mean, Africans had millions and millions of them, and of course the man who was selling them was making a great deal of money, so I guess you could say it was the last part of the commercial revolution, because it was a big business of slave trading. And rivalry in Europe first. Portugal, of course, was number one. It didn't take long for the Dutch and the English and the French to jump on board. And the Dutch West India Company was established in 1620 when it began to challenge Portugal big time. And by 17th century, there was a presence in, of slavery in the American colonies. But England's Henry VIII, he wanted to trade along the South American coast. But I've got coast there. It's not coast, it's coast. But England needed labor in the colonies. And in 1627, the Royal African Company, which is English, began its slave trade. In 1731, they actually gave up the slave trade, but it had nothing to do, and quite honestly, some of the uh, blacks that first came to the North American colony, which we'll get more into in the next chapter, uh, they were treated very well. Uh, and the irony was, these black men, they didn't get sick, they could take the heat, they knew how to farm. They were good planters. And in the beginning, of course, you had the biggest and the best. You had the chiefs of tribes that had been captured. You had the intellectuals. Uh, you had a good supply. Not that they came willingly, of course, but, you know, some they did. Asenio, A-S-I-E-N-T-O. It simply means the exclusive right to take slaves to the Spanish colonies. And during the Seven Years' War in 
what it was called in Europe, of course here in this country it's called the French and Indian War. More than 10,000 slaves went to Cuba and 40,000 went to Guadalupe. But English domination is going to come about because she's going to become the queen of the seas and everything she does. And by 1788, two-thirds of the slaves from England went to foreign colonies. American colonies are objecting. They're not too crazy about this slave trade, but we're getting awfully short of labor. So actually the English, you know, they've been developed different techniques over the years of trial and error and how to bring them in. And there was a trade circuit. Uh, I think your text mentions a triangular trade. Uh, we would get the slaves in Africa and take them to the islands and trade them for uh, sugar cane or something. And the sugar cane would go to New England and be processed into bourbon or rum. And then the rum would be sent back to Africa for more current slaves. But your text also said that we, from England to Africa, brass utensils and pewter and beads and gunpowder and liquor and foodstuffs, things that they didn't have. But there were trading posts in Africa. And the, oh, they had all this, you know, set out procedure of what we got to do. You'd visit the chief and you'd present him with gifts. And because you had to have permission to, you know, go hunting in his territory. So you wanted to trade in his area. And you would contact a man called a papasir, which is typically a man responsible for giving up those to be sold. And so you would sit there while you're talking to the chief and you're drinking the local brew. And uh, this man goes out and rounds up slaves and he brings them back and you inspect them and then you, you don't accept the first price you bargain for it and sometimes you had to remain in port for days for the number that you needed to be satisfied and then sometimes there'd be a delay in disposing of your ship's cargo and sometimes there'd be a delay in getting provisions for your ship because you had to have things like kidney beans and yams and corns and fruit and coconuts and plantains and I put what plantains was because quite honestly up until about a year ago I didn't know what they were myself uh, it looks like a dried up banana. It's used a lot in the Caribbean. It's a short stemmed oval of the banana family. Now, of course, the Africans offered resistance. They weren't going to go peacefully. And there'd be even wars between local tribes for the getting captives to sell to the white man. So they had to be chained. And some of them actually preferred death to captivity. And when they got on the ship, they'd jump overboard, but they'd know they were going to drown and get eaten by the sharks. It was a one-way passage, and it was a metal passage. You'd be captured in Africa, and you'd be put into one of these forts, and then you'd put on a boat and be sailed to the Americas. And then you were overcrowded, you were changed together, you had no freedom to exercise. And this basically is just a picture showing them being loaded as cargo into the hull. And here you are in the cargo hold, they're being mistreated. On these ships, they call death ship. And this, of course, is pen and ink drawing. Um, they're crowded conditions. You had smallpox and flux. There'd be hunger strikes for the men. Filth and stench. Oh my God, the stench would be terrible. And in some of the colonies, they wouldn't even let the slave ships get within two or three miles of the town because the stench from the ships were so bad. But only about 50% were actually survived good enough to work because suicide rates were not that high, but it was common. But the slave trade was very profitable. And of course, this is supposed to be an indication of the sleeping positions. You see you're on top of each other like cordwood. And of course you have to control them, so you keep them naked and you chain their arms and you chain their legs. And if they misbehave, this is an example of hanging them up by the ankle. This particular picture happened to be of a woman. A lot of times they would bring the females up on board ship and strip them naked to make them dance for them. And their excuse was, it's for their exercise. Of course there's a numbers controversy too. We do know that the 18th century was a peak in the slave trade, and an estimated 10 million or more brought over to the Americas, and that's not counting those that died, because there's a tremendous demand for labor. Because in the North America, especially, uh, anybody who had an ounce of ambition could gain land, but one man can only work so many acres, and if it's just you and you've got 100 acres, you've got to have somebody to work, and, and your neighbor who's white's not going to help you because he's got 100 acres too. But in the islands, when you've got these plantations of thousands of acres, you have to have thousands of acres to make a profit. You've got to have labor. And of course, like I said, the best Africans were taken from Africa in the beginning. The healthiest and the largest and the youngest and the ablest and the most culturally advanced. And it caused quite a drain on the African population. But within 400 years, the coup de grace of imperialism, uh, it ended, basically. But the colonial enterprises in the Caribbean.
very strong African presence because of the need for labor. And the Caribbean area was the first to develop the agricultural economy. Spain controlled Cuba and Puerto Rico and Hispaniola and Jamaica. Uh, English, John Hawkins. Oh, I gotta tell you a story about that. Now, John Hawkins was what we would call a middle class Englishman. Uh, he uh, wanted to trade with the islands. Well, the Spanish had this rule that uh, the Spanish islands could only trade with the Spanish people. Well, now, sometimes the Spanish islands might want some English wool or and the people in England might want some, you know, Spanish brandy or something. So they worked out a little, shall we say, system. Uh, Hawkins would take his group of ships into port and fire a volley of shots over the island. And then the governor or the mayor of the island would come out and surrender and ask what were the terms of surrender. And Hawkins would say, you have to trade. So this was supposed to be covering his behind, so to speak. So if the Spanish said anything to him, he could say, well, I was forced to, or they were going to, you know, bombard my town. And Hawkins could get his stuff. Well, somehow another the Spanish authorities found out this little rookie do thing was going on, and they sent the Spanish military fleet. So Hawkins goes into port one day and he fires a few shots, and the guys surrender and come out to surrender, and he turns around, and there's the entire Spanish fleet blocking his port so he can't get out. So he surrenders to the uh, Admiral, and under those conditions, normally you surrender, you know, you're going to be treated as prisoners. But the Admiral accepted the surrender, and as soon as he accepted the surrender, he had his ships fire on Hawkins' ships. Well, there had been originally been about a dozen ships, but only about two sur uh, sur uh, managed to survive, and Hawkins was on one of them. And there was a few men that uh, didn't get killed in the blast, but they were actually taken prisoners and taken back and under had to undergo the Spanish Inquisition. Well, because of this little episode, John Hawkins developed a hatred for the Spanish Catholics. Now, he managed to go back to Central and South America several times on raiding missions. And whenever he'd capture anybody, if they were Spanish or Catholic, he would kill them. If you were Indian or if you were uh, French or English, anybody else, he would let you go. But if you happen to be Spanish and Catholic, man, your doom was sealed. Uh, back to the English. They were actually selling slaves in Hispaniola. But France, and I've got a list of the places that they control, uh, Guadalupe, Martinique, uh, you know, in England, St. Christopher, Barbados, these places we go for vacations now. The Danes even control an island called St. Thomas. So all the countries in Europe, not only do they fight over control and trying to expand their borders, they're also fighting over these Caribbean islands. And because of this plantation system, the demand for sugar was just through the roof. Tobacco prices were out. Cotton and indigo were not profitable. It was sugar. Extremely profitable, but it takes a lot of labor. And the overpopulated islands were used for labor, of course. It was cheaper to buy a little slave than to buy a loaf of bread. And the inhumane the treatment was, oh my gosh. Like I said, uh, they didn't consider them human beings, so they didn't think anything about killing them or cutting off an arm or a leg. Uh, the both birth rate was low and the death rate was high. And absentee owners, because the English were not going to go to the islands, the climate was not suitable to their needs. The island was a source of income. You didn't go there to live. And if you didn't go there to live, why would you bother improving the schools and the churches? I mean, why would you do that for somebody else? That doesn't make any sense. And these new slaves, when they would arrive in the Caribbean, of course, they had to be seasoned, as we said earlier. Uh, some would be put with veterans who would teach them how, and some would be put in special areas to be taught not to resist. Of course, the death rate, even after they got here, of seasoning was about 30% because you had diseases and climate, uh, lack of food, not lack of food, lack of food. Uh, some of them would run away and some would die of exposure. Uh, some committed suicide and flogging. Sometimes they would give them, you know, 500 lashes and it would kill them. Long hours. And there was no difference working on the plantation between men and women. And no care at all was taken in pregnant women. And, of course, the food was totally inefficient. But it didn't take long till we start having black majorities, because sometimes it was 20 times greater. And the white man looked around and said, ooh, there's more of them than us. And they come up with slave codes. You had to have a pass to leave the plantation. Couldn't have a weapon, of course. Uh, no alcohol, uh, no intermarriage. Uh, and, of course, if you stroke, struck a Christian, oh, man, you could be branded or whipped or executed. Now, the French slave code was called Code Noir. And they did an awful lot of flogging with those cat-and-nine tails. 
or something that can hang you from a tree with weights around you, like the old stretching routine. But of course, there's resistance. Cruel treatment supposed to prevent uprising, but it doesn't. Now, in Jamaica, there was a runaway slave. A bunch of them get together, and they're called maroons. And these maroons, they would hide out in the jungles, and they would continually harass the planters. And one of the leaders of the maroons was Cujo. And in Haiti, they, of course, they had maroons too, but they had so many of them that in 1784, the colonial government actually recognized them. But they had a leader too, Mackendall, who was a Native American and African, and he became a leader for proposed revolt. He had a good idea. Let's put water and poison in the water, you know, and poison all the whites. But the plot was discovered, and surprise, he was executed. But the Danish islands really had a lot of slave resistance, especially at St. Thomas, which was a big only on in the head. They tried executions and punishments of burning and hanging and whipping, and it just caused more uprising. A lot of whites were murdered, a garrison was captured, and there was days and days of terror before they were actually put down. Because cruelty, it reaps murder and bloodshed and creates more terror. Now, it took years to get these worker seasons. And if the worker was misbehaving and you didn't have any lot of trouble uh, with the others, you take the one that's causing the problem and you ship him to another island. So let's talk about slavery in Brazil for a few minutes. Portuguese, the country of Portugal owned, of course, Brazil, and they supplied most of the sugar from Europe. In Brazil, five out of six slaves actually worked on plantations, not just sugar, but there was coffee and cotton and cocoa. And they worked from before sunup to after sunset, and their diet of salt, pork, and boiled some kind of squash. But if you had a humane owner, you might get some beans or bacon or corn or yams or rice. But after three years of working in the plantation fields, three of the four would be dead. But they also introduced to the South Americans vegetables and cooking oil and milk and honey. You see, that white plantation owner was very lazy. They were usually white, and they threatened and tortured and whipped the slaves. And because of it, you know, Industrial crafts developed very slowly in Brazil. No machinery was used, and it was only begrudging to actually use the ox and mule. I mean, if it, it took four people to do a job, they'd do one, have one do it. They wanted the greatest possible use of the slave and were not interested in extending his life or providing him with better food or housing. Now, we in the 21st century can't even imagine what life must have been like. Because with the ever-increasing supply of black slaves, and it didn't take long, before they were black, and we went through that. Um, I had a section I was going to tell you about. Well, I guess I misplaced it. Let me give you another example. Uh, you, we in the 21st century have difficulty understanding all this, but Society has a temptation to exploit anyone who only has his labor to offer and has no power to protect himself. For in, example, in England during this same time period, the 14th and 15th century, the poor would become bonded servants and people sold their children into apprenticeship, which was legal slavery. And the poor were oppressed as savagely as any white. And without work, without any rights, the poor would wander the roads and looked on with contempt. And like I said, in the 17th century, the sale of sugar in Europe increased and the price went up. Not only were the workers working in the fields and planting the sugar and cutting it and taking it to the mills and purifying it, all work related to the plantation sugar fields were being done by the slaves. And the more work the slave did, of course, the less work the white master did. Slaves literally became the white man's feet. They dressed him. They put on his trousers and his boots, and they bathed him, and they brushed him, and they hunted his body for fleas or lice. And the white master in South America became a master living in a hammock, waking just long enough to give orders to the slaves, or maybe play a game of backgammon, eat something or make love, and then go back to sleep. But there are slaves everywhere. And like I said, the slaves were being uh, subjected to very rigid slave codes. But the African did not come peacefully through the New World, as we've mentioned. And we've already mentioned the Maroons, and there are so many in Haiti that the government recognized them in 1784. 
But as demand from North America increased, exportation increased. Now, sugar depletes the soil, and of course, you need more workers. So this means import increased importation from Africa. Surprise. But the whites in the islands, religion, education, not prevalent among the blacks. The advice and immorality flourished. Ignorance prevailed. And the whites were unable to prevent any escapes or insurrections. They just didn't seem to know what to do. They couldn't understand why these black people didn't just want to work for them. Now, in the mainland Amer Latin America, in the beginning, of course, the Spanish were dominant. Uh, the crown controlled the uh, sending of the slave trade. And at first, they only sold to Christian masters. But then they were going in Mexico and Panama and Colombia and Peru and Argentina and Central America. But there was also smugglers bringing in. It wasn't just the crown. But the black presence in Brazil, like I said, uh, Portuguese. And there's three distinct groups of uh, laborers or slaves in Brazil. You have the urban. Now, he, he's got it good. He can work in the city and crafts. You've got the uh, freelancer, the Negro, the Gajo. Uh, these are the ones who are usually very talented or have a special skill of some kind. You've got the ones who work in the mines and the sugar and cotton fields and plantations. But also in Portugal or in Brazil, there was no law against education. And you had to be baptized within the Catholic Church within one year and go to Mass. They also had a cute little rule that once a female would have ten children, she would be free. Now, the slaves in Brazil, they worked out uh, in the plantations. They worked in not just plantations, but gold mines and diamond mines and iron mines. And the irony is that, you know, with the diamond mines, it's awful easy to steal. So they were very rigid. They strip searched those guys as soon as they come out of the mines. Not only that, but they worked as teachers to the white children. And they were used in industry. And the black man could become free. He could even become a priest or a barber or a dentist. I've listed several things here. And the biggest thing, teachers are the white children. But like I said, they had to be baptized after one year and attend mass. So the church is very strong here. But even with all this going on, there's still a constant source of problems because they live in poverty. And... I think that relates a story in there about a group of rebels that refused to surrender and they ended up killing themselves, which reminded me to Masada in Israel when the uh, Jewish people would not surrender to the Romans and instead committed mass suicide. But slavery in Latin America is unique, mainly because there's a small number of whites. It's not like in North America where the whites outnumbered the blacks. And the owners were down there. They didn't have their families. They'd just be down there to make a profit and go home. And, of course, there were the maroon communities of those runaway slaves and the Catholic Church, very big. But Brazil declares independence from Portugal in 1822. In 1850, she abolished her slave trade. Didn't get rid of slavery, just abolished bringing slaves in. In 1871, they passed the law of the free womb. In other words, all children born to slaves were free. 1885, all slaves reaching the age of 65 were automatically free. And three years later, May the 13th, 1888, the Golden Law, slavery is abolished. And when it was abolished in 1888, one out of 20 in a population of 14 million were slaves. That is a large percentage. But in the British colonies of North America, of course, the slaves were not allowed to learn to read or write. They couldn't make contracts. They couldn't marry without permission. They were really not encouraged to go to church. And they had no esteem, whereas if you... Even if you were a slave in South America and you were uh, contributing, like you had a skill or you were a priest or something like that, you had a little bit of esteem. And the owners had their families with them. They lived on the plantation with them. Now, this does not mean that slaves were better off in Latin America because inhumane cruelty is in all parts of the world and slavery is inhumane and cruel. So is our little trip to biting two chapters and two texts. And when you have your test, I promise you, I will not go to the chapters and make questions about something that we've not covered. The test questions will come from the lectures. So the next lesson, lesson four, is going to be from the edition, ninth edition, chapter three, called Establishing North American Slavery. Now I'm going to try to get time this week to go back and change your syllabus to match your text that we're going to be using and adjust that tentative schedule of lessons and, and post it on Blackboard. If you have any problems or you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me or even call me. The phone number is in the syllabus. That has not changed. Again, all I can do is apologize to you for the confusion we've had this last week. Uh, 
I think with most of you now having edition 9, uh, we're going to be okay. Again, all test questions will come from the lectures.